I'm speaking with Chris Bodie, and he will be in town April 3rd at 7.30 at the Sandler Center in Virginia Beach. Chris, good to have you here speaking with us. Good to be here, and uh, good to be coming back to the Sandler Center. Looking forward to it. Now, you've played that room several times. This will at least be like fourth or third or fourth time for sure. Do yeah. you, do you rem- I know you tour so much, man, and you keep going back to these places. Do you remember the Sandler Center? Absolutely. It's beautiful. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, absolutely. And do you remember the, like, the acoustical vibe you get from the room? Is there anything yeah, that's... Oddly enough, I remember how pretty it is from the outside. It's, 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 it's a new structure. I mean, so it's kind of a modernish kind of looking building, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah I, I commented on, like, I, when, when we get inside, I have a faint idea, but I kind of remember I, I was striking from the outside, and I thought it was cool looking, so... Right. Um, here's a question I would like to ask you. Like when I watch your show, for example, I mean, there are extremes, man. I mean, you, you guys go from, you know, you'll stretch out and get into some, some more progressive jazz type concepts, right? And then you'll come back and edge into the smooth side just a little bit, you know? So there's, there's this 180 in, 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 in some ways in your shows. I mean, it's very, very expanded. When you're stretching out like that, right? And Lee might be bashed in a little bit, or Joey might be stretching out a little bit, and you are stretching out a little bit. Do you ever feel like, hmm, is this too much? Do I pull it back, or, or do, you, do you do you worry about anything like that when you're playing? Well, if we okay, for instance, if we came out and played, you know, a whole set of just real cerebral. Miles Davis live at the plug nickel sort of stuff. Right. Uh, I think that the audience probably wouldn't know what the heck's going on. Right. But I think when you, in short little kind of views of it, you can play serious acoustic straight ahead jazz. If they kind of know a backstory of what's going on, or if you kind of talk about, you know, who's going to solo and what the what what to focus on. You know, listen, the, my it worked out fine for Miles to turn his back to the audience, but that's not my trip. You know, and I. I you know, explain to the audience and, and take them along on the ride with us. And I think that there's something that's linked to kind of when you hear a great violinist play Paganini. They don't necessarily go home and listen to that all the time. They go home and listen to Chopin, right? You know, right. but but when they hear and they see an incredible violinist like Joshua Bell play Paganini, they go, "Oh my goodness, it's incredible!" Right? So, so when we kick up the you know the volume or kick up the tempo and we're playing all this technical stuff, there's there's some you know, visceral kind of macho, for a lack of a better word, they we're stretching and going for it, and and I think the audience loves it. I mean, we do that on on uh, you don't know what love is when we're really busting out the tempo and playing all this crazy stuff, and every night it gets a standing ovation. Now that same audience isn't going to necessarily go home and listen to you know John Coltrane with Elvin and to some club. You know, it's <laughs> like it's a completely different sort of thing. But you know, then we turn around and we play an opera piece, right, or right, a classical right. violin piece, or a pop piece, or you know whatever it is, and. And I think it's the it's the roller coaster aspect of the stuff that makes my fans remain with me. I think you know, and because if we just walked down and we just played a purely, absolutely purely straight ahead jazz gig, yeah, no, <laughs> I don't think. And nor would I want to hear that either. You know, I mean, ultimately, I I do what I want to hear. You know, and and uh, and so that's that's the way we sort of sculpt the show. So so you play what you like. Now, I Absolutely. Know, I, I mean, get that yeah. as a programmer, you know, man, Jay, yeah. do, you, do you play what you like or do you play things that, you know, you may not be that comfortable with, but you you think your people might like it? I mean, I'm, I, to be honest with you, I'm probably way more comfortable and way more known for playing all the beautiful sort of cinematic stuff than I necessarily am going to like knock Lee Morgan off some sort of a uh, jazz critics perch, you know, like it, right, it's right. not, you know, it's like, okay, I, I, you know, my, my records for the large portion are completely different than my live shows. The live shows have all that roller coaster stuff, but the records are unabashedly romantic and trying to, you know, sound pretty, you know, and so I'm focusing on my sound and the phrasing and to try to make it beautiful. And I'm, I'm very much at home in that, in that situation. Uh, but I also recognize, and we've added saxophone now to the band, and and you know, like we're we're coming out and we're blazing. So we need to do that to also keep it interesting for us, because you know we're on the road now, seventeen years, two hundred and sixty-five days a year, and so we, you know, we just can't come out and just like play just the pretty stuff. We need to like push the envelope. Who's playing sax with you now? 
Um, Andy Snitzer. And oh, okay, yeah, great player, man, awesome. And great. Well, you mentioned something about solos, like. Is it plotted out before you come out? Like who's going to take a solo where? Or do you, or do you go with the moment? What's what's what it's feeling like? It's, that sort of thing. It's it's it's, it's plotted out in the sense that um, we know who's going first and who's going second and who's going third. It's one of it's one of my major major pet peeves when I either feel like the band is a jam session, like in other words, oh, uh, who's going to take a solo? No one knows, right. or if they just do the same solo order on every single song. Like, if you, this is a little detailed, but, like, I never even have the same person counting off the song. It's all always different. Everything is totally kind of planned that way to make it completely seem, you know, one person plays the intro, the next person, no one really ever counts off a song. We just begin, mm -hmm. and, and we played with each other so much we kind of know where it's at. So we do plot out who solos first, but that's it. You know, from whatever it goes on after that, it's all kind of up, up, for, up for grabs. What's your preference in playing? I mean, first of all, I'll compliment you on your tone, man. I mean, you have a beautiful tone, uh, great intonation. Um, I love the way you play to the mic. I mean, all those things, you know. Thank you. You, you do it enough and you practice. Clearly, you would shed a lot, but you play so much. Um but what what did you have a preference like in in for forget fans for a second okay do, do you just what would you be playing you know? I mean I, I mean you know we we've, we've added a couple things from from kind of blue uh, blue and green and so what but but blue and green is for me is 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 a real sweet spot because it's it you know you're playing pretty but also you can you can play through harmony, you know. Right. So there's there's a there's a set of chess moves, intelligently speaking, musically, that that differentiate you from someone that doesn't necessarily have you know the maturation or the content or whatever. Like on a jazz musician level, you can like it, but then there's the beautiful part that exists in blue and green that the audience is like, oh my god, this is incredible. So I love that stuff. I also love playing, you know, Paululia or 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 when I fall in love, or we walk out with the band, or, or, or you know, it, it, I guess at the end of the day, I'm a trumpet player, you know, and so my relationship on stage isn't necessarily with the song that we're playing, it's it's with the relationship I'm having with the trumpet, because I got to practice the thing every day to make sure it doesn't fight me every night on stage, right. so many hours, that, uh, that, you know, I'm mostly concerned about a physical, oral kind of, uh, you know how it's sounding and how the trumpet's resonating on in my body and stuff like that, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking about most of the time when I'm playing. You you play so much, and there's so much energy and exertion, man, over the course of a performance. Like I was thinking about Maynard Ferguson, for example. I mean, he had like multiple hernia operations, but, and I think that was because physically the way he played the trumpet. Yeah. Do, do you worry about like like anything like that on that level? Because you play so much, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, hmm. I mean, I would like to say no. I mean, I think as a trumpet player, you you have to realize that the you, anything you could get hernia, you could get a back or your lip, right? Sp back spasm, or you could get Bell's palsy or lip thing. Yeah, there's a million. There's a mirror. You could your shoulder could get screwed up or numbness in your fingers. I mean, there's a lot of things that people get as they get older. That, that's why that's why Trump. That's why I get up and I go to the practice room every day for four hours because I don't want to lose that elasticity of my sound, you know. And and what happens generally, especially if you look at all the great jazz trumpet players, like even using Miles Davis as an example, when he was in his forties and his early fifties, how great! How he was not only so much better than he was in his twenties and thirties. Physically and and maturation wise, and his ability to improvise, and his band behind him. But then when he got, you know, he retired and he tried to come back. He didn't have nearly the, the stamina and the chops, and he had other vices that he needed to worry about, right? But uh, it, it is it's uh, being a trumpet player is a lot of work, and it's a lot of hand eye coordination that nobody sees on stage. But you know, you're just working it out in the practice room all day long, you know, and so so that's that's what that's what I really try to maintain is to try to maintain that that kind of strength on the horn besides miles 
who were some of your favorite trumpet players? Yeah, I had to ask that question. Right? I mean, I, I I like all the usual suspects: Clifford and Freddie and Winton and Woody Shaw and Lee Morgan and Kenny Wheeler and I. You know, I I, I, Kenny I like Kenny Wheeler. All the, wow, all, all okay. the uh, you know. All the yeah, new high man. Good yeah, record. oh my God, that record, man. <laughs> oh, Keith Jarrett, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I junk out of Keith Jarrett's "Melody Night with You" is perhaps my one of my favorite all time records. You know, it's a. Uh, Did you hear the story with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, no. The the, the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I think that's what I had heard. Yeah, you know. and he he gave it to his wife as a present, and I think when the family went to sleep at night, he went into his recording studio and and just hit record and, and, and played for those listeners that don't know what we're talking about. This, the album is called the melody at right. night with you. And right. he plays a series of standards, but he plays it kind of more like Chopin. It's not really like a jazz record, but it's a beautiful record and it, it has such a cult fan base. So like when I'm on a plane or if I'm at home, you know, I just put that on and it's just like end of day, you know, it's like the best because you're listening to art on such a high level and you're also listening to stuff that you can just drift off into, you know, and that that's what Miles Davis's kind of blue had the same way, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so few records have that ability to have great musicians on it, you, but you, also it can just kind of act as a tapestry if you want. You know, one of the things that, that really was intriguing to me about that record is how little improvisation is right. on that record. Right. It's he basically it, melody. He put, but he, but, but the harmony is almost like Chopin. It's like yeah, yeah, classical yeah. music. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not swung. It's, it's played like the way you would a ballad in jazz, mm-hmm. but the harmony, you know, and if, if you go to multiple uh, viewings of Keith Jarrett, we are really getting intense here. If you go to multiple viewings of Keith Jarrett playing, say, for instance, I Loves You Porgy, uh, he's playing, it's almost like it's worked out, written out. He's almost playing note for note that, and so much thought went into preparing what he played. It's kind of like classical music, but boy, is it brilliant. It's great. Mm. And the, the, to wrap this up, man, I, when you talk about trumpet players, you know, obviously you've gone through some lineage. You know, when you think of like, there's a difference between like great trumpet players or great guitar players, great piano players, great drummers, whatever, but there are the ones that change the landscape. And like Coltrane did, for example. Sure. Um, from the from your instrument perspective, who would you put in that category? In the, in the one or two or three players, and why? Well, Miles, Clifford, Freddie. Freddie, uh, uh, interesting. I mean, I, I Miles, love Freddie. Don't get me wrong. I my, love Freddie. Miles. Miles, because there's just nobody better than him. No, no one cooler phrasing wise than them. I happened to get with Miles and listen to that music from then on out, where a lot of people backed up into Louis Armstrong first, which I I think is totally fine. I, I get what I get where they're coming from that, um, but you also got to bear in mind like like people that really changed the landscape also were represented by a certain time. In other words, no matter what, you know. Lady Gaga is never going to be the Beatles, right? Because it's a different time. I mean, that's a bad example, but John Mayer is never going to be Bob Dylan, in other words, right? So right. so if you say, John Mayer, what do you think about your new record? Oh, great. Well, John Mayer is worried about John Mayer's audience and his career and his life, right? But Bob Dylan changed the world because the world was open to that change. The Beatles got off that plane to do the Ed Sullivan show, and the world was waiting for that change to quote a John Mayer song waiting for the world to change. Um, uh, and, and so I think with the way that we're all connected now, it, it, someone to come along and like change the landscape of music. It, 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 it's, it's much more fractional. It's much more smaller, uh, scope. So, so besides miles, you don't think there was another trumpeter that had that. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Cause they were, because they were all alive at the time when the, the world was waiting for that. Right. So the jazz musicians of that generation and Louis were able to really change the landscape. Whereas Winton, in my opinion, one of my favorite trumpet players and perhaps technically one of the greatest of all time, uh, came and, and, and exploded for his thing, but changing the landscape of jazz, yeah. it, it, you know, it's, it's harder to say whether that, that he did that like Miles and Clifford and, and Lee Morgan and, and Freddie. Uh, cause, because j- that's when they're inventing jazz, you know, that's right. dizzy. You know, I mean, I, 
you know, I don't find myself listening to Dizzy all the time. You know, I love Freddie's sound, the warmth and the fatness of his sound, and Clifford the same, and Winton of, of a person more in my generation. And uh, and then, of course, sitting way over on this own island by himself <laughs> is uh, is Miles, because he, he had that ability to not only play the trumpet, but break your heart, you know? And, and a lot of times... You know the the other artists had swagger and stuff like that, but they didn't they didn't have that tenderness, that absolute simplicity and beauty that Miles would unleash, and it was just you know to me it makes him the greatest. The the thing why why wasn't the the Harmon mute used more in jazz? Why did Miles to say decide to say hmm? I think I want to try I mean, this. Did, did, did Dizzy used it? Um, and but what Miles did that was so interesting is he and you mentioned playing into a microphone. I mean, I got a lot of that from like, look, you know, when you look at those old videos of the way Miles would put that mute kind of right on the microphone, not too close, but like an inch and a half mm-hmm. and play mm-hmm. soft, right? you know, whereas everyone else like Lee and, and those guys, they played pretty full on all the time, lots of volume through the horn all the time. And Miles turned it in inwardly and, uh, and use that mute to like, like really draw out uh, a haunting, dark, beautiful thing, rather than you know, uh, uh, dizzy playing over like Night in Tunisia with the harmony mute. See what I'm saying? Did the, did, does the mute affect your intonation? Yeah, you gotta you you just you adjust with the tuning slide. Uh, and, and yeah, it's 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 hard for some people. I don't find it a problem. I'm lucky that way. But but to a lot of people, it's hard to play in tune. It's got it's a you know. It also depends on what kind of mute you have. I have a great I have great equipment. So. It's from the my mutes from the '60s and my trumpets from 1939, and I'm real fortunate with my setup, particularly on the on the trumpet. Yeah, but you had to work at that, though, man. That's not well. Yeah, you got to you got to work at it, but you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, look, I you know I know you're a busy guy, man. It's it's been a lot of fun talking to you, man. I can sit here and just just we can just talk well, music. This is certainly the most in depth interview I've given in a long time, and I, it's so much fun for me. And I hope the audience. Uh, uh, went along on the ride for us because boy, we got some pretty detailed stuff going there. That was great. <laughs> well, our our audience can handle it, that's for sure. And you don't know me. You, you, I know you don't know me, but I also play the music. So ah, fantastic. You know, you know James Jean is a good friend, and oh, you know, right on. Uh, Billy great. Childs and all those guys. Yeah, and uh, I was just talking to Billy Childs the other day. He's great, man. Yeah, what a yeah. what a great, great, great. So guy. the band, the last part, band you're bringing here now, touring with you. Lee's playing drums, right? Lee's playing drums. Reggie Hamilton on bass. Leonardo Muedo on guitar and Eldar. Do you know Eldar? Of course, the Eldar's yeah. playing with you now. Wow! Yeah, he's playing piano. Oh man! And uh, and then we can you have... pronounce his last name? <laughs> the dog of you don't know. So I mean, I guess just going by Eldar. One the name says it yeah. all, right? Yeah. Have you ever the heard? Russian. I get the Russian. I get the Russian pronunciation all. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard him play Monin? The original version of him playing Monin? Yeah, we play that on stage too. Oh my God! When he was like what eighteen years old or something? Yeah, I mean he played in the Grammys solo jazz piano for five minutes when he was twelve. <laughs> oh. The guy's a genius. Yeah, he's, yeah, he is. He's, man. A, he's great. Is Joey yeah. still with you? Uh, Joey's he's he's doing <clears throat> spot dates. He won't be in this at uh, this one, but he just. Did a week with us in San Francisco, and he did Japan with us for a week, and uh, he's going to do some dates. Yeah, we, 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 we get him when we can. We got him out west a little bit in April, but he sadly he won't be there. But, man, how great is he? He's fantastic. And, I, and I'm embarrassed because I forgot her name, the violinist. Is she with you on this on this tour? I'm not sure if, if you're talking about – are you talking about Caroline Campbell? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't I, – I can't I, – think she is but i'm not sure but if she's not then don't worry we got someone great because we we kind of mix in and out of three different violinists right now hmm. so it's either going to be delaney or um or sandy cameron or delaney harder or or caroline campbell so and i i'm sad to say i don't know who's who's going to be on the gig but it'll be someone good well chris thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to speak with us chris Bodie. the concert is april 3rd 7 30 p.m at the sandler center in Virginia Beach. Chris, a pleasure. Good luck to you, buddy. And, and um, hopefully I can make it down to the show, but it's our radio fundraiser week. Um, so that might be kind of tricky, but. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for the great interview. I had so much fun. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Okay. Take care. Good Bye-bye. luck. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.